um, because I think it can, awesome. Um, I think that uh, this will be good. I might pivot a little bit just to make this more, more about you <laughs> and hopefully that can, that can be helpful. So just kind of before I get started, I've got a, a small presentation just to kind of walk through how I think about boards. We actually just converted as an, to a nonprofit ourselves. And so we're starting to get this process up and running and uh, would love to share kind of how we thought about that process from a game design angle. Um, and then, so as, as we're kind of going through this, would love you to think about kind of your own interaction with your board. I don't actually know um, what your positions are in your organization. So if you want to in the chat, just kind of brief introduction, kind of what your role is and like how much you've interacted with the board. I imagine there actually might be board members on the call. So I would want to leave space for that too. Um, so for those just coming in, um, your name, uh, what your role is at the organization, how much interaction you've had with the board. Uh, and we'll start there because I think that will allow me to kind of see who's in the room. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Laura. All right, so I'm reading through some of these chats. Yeah, I so I think there are a lot of different ways that you can interact with your board. I I'm going to share a link in a second of a or later on that is one of my kind of favorite resources to go to, both as uh, kind of a philanthropist in the area, but also um, in thinking about you know, reflecting on kind of our board service and what it means to be on our board and the expectations that we set. All right, cool. I'm seeing. Excellent. All right, so it looks like a lot of people either in development leadership of an organization, uh, familiar with a few people on the call, so uh, nice to see you again. Okay, so I'm going to launch a new presentation. Uh, we're gonna play first because this is what I fully believe in. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay, so board engagement, uh, is what we're talking about. We're going to play a quick game uh, just to kind of get our minds going. Um, this is a game that we really like to play because it sets the stage for a lot of different creative engagement. Our next workshop next month is all about creative programming. And so this is maybe a small foreshadowing of that. But your goal here um, as we play this game is to identify and in the chat type an object or as many objects as you can think of that qualify through these three kind of descriptors. So something that's blue, something that has an R in the word, so, and something that's light. So I'll give you an example, something like a feather. A feather would be off of a bluebird, uh, has the letter R in it, and it's a light thing. Um, and we'll just get people to toss a bunch of ideas in the chat. I'll follow along, um, give you like a couple minutes. Think of this as kind of like categories if you've ever played it. Um, blueberry, I love it, that's a good one. There's a method to this madness in a second. See if anybody else can think of, think of a word that has those three descriptors. Burlap, I like it. I always like when setting up this game and, and people kind of looking around and being like, where's my light blue objects? Uh, <laughs> I'll give it another minute here. Robin's egg, blue ribbon, nice, yeah. Should have chosen a different color. Blue postcard, yes. Now we're coming, getting more creative. There really are not very many rules to this game other than there are like three things that you have to follow. Empty blue binder, yes, nice. A river, nice, ooh, that's good. Okay, so we'll keep thinking, uh, just kind of getting the brain going. We, this will be a very short version of this, but one of the things that I always recommend doing um, is to try to identify prism. Oh, I like that one. Uh, try to identify things that, that really energize people in the room. So find things that are um, interesting to them, fun, um, make that board meetings, <clears throat> 
something that people want to come to. I think that's going to be um, a kind of overarching theme here of just like making this a higher priority for people. I think boards in general have gone through uh, an interesting transition in the last 15 months to think about kind of what is their role in a time of of high need for nonprofits, especially the smaller, medium-sized ones that are already strapped for time, but now they've got to deal with the pandemic. Uh, and so, you know, thinking critically about how you can bring everyone to the table and get people excited um, to participate. And so that will be kind of the overarching theme today. And games are good ways of just setting a culture. Um, and so every meeting we like to start our, our meetings off with a game. And if it takes 35 minutes to play a game and we only budgeted an hour, I take that as really helpful, you know, good quality time with our board that we can learn about them and relationships and things that they like to do so that when we follow up, we have something communal that we can share uh, and we can use that as leverage for building better relationships. And, and that comes with an accountability. Um, and so that's kind of a high level, high level takeaway. Um, okay. So I'll come back to what this means in a moment, um, but we'll we'll choose one of our favorite blue items uh, at the end of this to, to do an interactive exercise. So for those of you who don't know me or Game Genius, um, my name is Peter Williamson. Um, Game Genius is a it was <clears throat> launched in in 2018 um, as a personal venture uh, that I was able to to create around kind of my three topics of interest. So I was um, an architecture and geography student in school. And so I was always really interested in designing places and spaces that made um, people reflect on their passions and, and their, their interests. Um, I was a professional golfer for a number of years. And so using games and play to catalyze community growth and entertainment was something that I always really enjoyed. Um, and then I come from a philanthropic background. So I've I'm a part of a family foundation. I'm very open and transparent about that process and really believe that there, the relationship between funder and fundee, supporter and supportee, uh, board member and staff is critical to good nonprofit kind of stewardship. Um, and I bring a bunch of different perspectives from those angles. So I'm happy to answer questions from kind of like all of the above today, if it's helpful. Um, but here kind of in the capacity of of Game Genius and, and what we do is we provide play-based services and experiences to support organizations like yours, leaders, organizations, and socially beneficial initiatives in the greater Washington, D.C. region. We focus very hyper-local for the point of building trust in communities. And <clears throat> although this idea has the ability to scale you know, globally, um, play-based initiatives are, are becoming more and more widespread you know, through education and through diff just different ways of professional development, we really want to focus in on a community, building the relationships within that community and hopefully harboring um, those relationships in a way that make things more collaborative. I think as a, as a person on the funding side, we see a lot of silos and we see a lot of people competing for funders. Um, and so trying to find and build spaces where people can collaborate and potentially grow together is, is what we're all about. Um, we're fiscally sponsored right now because we're pending as a 501c3. So the Ocean Foundation has been very generous to us in, in kind of holding our, our capital. Um, <clears throat> in terms of work that we do, I know this can feel a little bit abstract. Some of you I've actually talked to uh, on one-on-one -on -one calls, so you've probably heard this spiel before, um, but we kind of have three branches at Game Genius. We think about games and how they can be service, direct service uh, work. So an example of that might be we lead a team building workshop. Um, we help create um, a way to showcase your mission in a fun and interactive way. Um, it could be thinking about your programming. It could be thinking about your board engagement. And so for the sake of today, uh, I'll highlight an example of when we went into um, a foundation board and helped them think about um, how they wanted to prioritize their giving. And so this example picture on the left um, was an exercise that I'll, I'll share in a little bit that utilizes a model called the six thinking hats. Um, and they're just a lot of play-based community building type tools that can be really helpful approaches for thinking about 
um, those kinds of direct service models. And whether you bring someone out outside of your organization to run that, or you have someone internally who can help, um, you know, thinking about those models can be really helpful. So always happy to dive into kind of the capacity and empowerment of people and being able to use games in a specific way. The middle bucket is, is more products oriented. So we help build games uh, that are around the mission. So these are like physical uh, or social games that can help, uh, that you can use in a, a capacity to help explain the mission or the project that you're working on to people that are in your orbit. So that could be program participants. And in the case of this, really helping align your board. So thinking about how games and playing games together um, that are specific to the organization's mission um, can help build a better sense of alignment around what your goals are for the end of the year and really kind of put yourself on the same playing field so that people can see how they can help the organization best. And so we really like to use this experience as a way for staff to connect with their boards but also a collaborative effort where boards can come in and help create this game and co-design it with the staff so that they have a very intimate relationship with what the organization is trying to do. And then the part on the right is really similar, but just kind of take it into an experiential lens. So instead of making a physical product, you're making an experience. So your gala, uh, your annual benefits, those kinds of things, bringing board members into that experience um, can be extremely beneficial um, to the end result, but also to get more organic growth of that event itself. So thinking about you know, how they can help bring people into, if you're selling tables or tea times or however you're going about your annual benefit, how can the board member, how can you activate them in an effective way and, and make that um, kind of leverage their strengths? So um, just checking the chat. Yes, thank you. Yeah, feel free to um, yeah drop down. You know what you're thinking about uh, in terms of how board members can um, engage with your organization. I do feel like cross sharing um, is is one of the best things that organizations can do. It's it doesn't happen a lot of times, and that's why I love Catalog for Philanthropy. Thank you, Laura and team, um, for being a resource where people can exchange these ideas because they're there's a good chance that someone on this call has done something uh, to address the problem that you're seeing at your board level. Uh, and I will never claim to be like the end all be all of information. So I uh, believe that kind of the wisdom of, of the group here has, has a lot of really cool innovative ideas that they've tried, things that have worked, things that haven't, and, and maybe some reflections off of that. Um, so, I think it would be helpful just to take a step back to, to share a little bit about how we put together our board. Um, to me, when, when I think about designing a game, one of the first things I will think about is the structure, the system that I'm trying to build. Um, and the board was no different. I, I see each board member as like a particular key, right? And you're, you've got a bunch of different projects and ideas and kind of ambitions that you want to want to fulfill with your organization. And each board member is very unique. They bring all sorts of talents, um, different amounts of time. Uh, they, they bring kind of a passion point or a, a, the, the, the why of why they're participating might be slightly different. Uh, they could see your vision and um, kind of imprint their own feelings of that the biggest piece is to empower them in their sort of individual uniqueness uh, and put them into a structure that you feel like can be beneficial to what you're doing. You don't want them to define your overall plan, but rather um, you wanna find a way for their key to fit into one of the things that you really want to do. Um, I think that relationship is really important um, that the, the staff is kind of driving the bus, um, but the, the board members can, can absolutely help it help it along. Um, so our board is, is currently six people. Um, <clears throat> my partner and I um, are two of the day-to-day -day people. Um, we're very small. And <clears throat> we onboarded four people um, that came from four very different backgrounds that showed passion in our mission. And we built relationships over the last couple of years of just what we're doing and, and where we're trying to go. And and they had the, the time and, and passion to join us. 
we set up a structure where we were really intentional about wanting to carve out project working committees so that we could see where we were um, strongly supported. So if we had a lot of people who had financial background, they might really be able to help us in the fundraising efforts. But we, as a two person team and a handful of interns, like we need some help on the marketing side of things. We need some help on impact and evaluation to be able to go and go for grants. And so figuring out where our holes are uh, allows us to kind of define that next key that we're looking for on our board. Um, and so just having an intentional approach to the things that you want to do, the holes that you that you feel like you have on your board and finding someone who really believes in your mission is, is really important. Um, <clears throat> that kind of brings me to the <laughs> the, the different ways that a board member can support. I think what's great about philanthropy is that it's evolved a lot, I think, over the last decade or two um, in normalizing philanthropy as not just giving money. Um, there's a lot of talent on your board. There's a lot of time, hopefully, on your board. And most importantly, of maybe all of these things, they have connections that you don't. Um, and so thinking about how you can leverage sort of time, talent, treasure, and ties, if you want to think of them as the four T's um, of your board members and how they want to support you um, is, is really, is, is I think the most critical piece. If you force someone to give, give you $1,000 and, and they feel like that's, that's the capacity that they can give, that's totally fine. Um, but more often than not, you see strong boards that can leverage maybe two or three of these things out of any one board member. Um, I, all, all of our board members have been able to offer um, their networks. I think the, the networking, especially as a small organization, just gives you so much potential to find new funders, to find new board members. Um, and so thinking about uh, having a little bit of diversity across these spectrums too, um, can help you kind of find those different keys to fit your positions. But again, really opening up the idea that board members can be more than just people who donate their, their dollars uh, and potentially a little bit of time when it comes to your events. Uh, they have a lot, a lot more to give than that. Um, then kind of framing this in a couple different ways. So I've seen all sorts of different boards because at different times of, of kind of an organization's lifespan, like ours is really early. So we're kind of at the starter board level. We're just putting it together. Um, the chances of our four board members staying on for a really long time is probably a lot less than uh, a really well-established organization that's got um, a couple, couple people who wanna be there for, for a while. Um, and so thinking about kind of the philosophy of your board um, and how you want to build around uh, is, is is I think a useful exercise. And so I've seen a couple things that base, based off of the strengths of your board. So thinking about doing a behavioral assessment like a strengths finder, if you're not familiar with these kinds of models, um, others are like DISC and uh, the Enneagram. And there, there are a handful of these things that can really help you get on the same page and align with your board. Um, I always find these things super interesting and really cool reflective exercises. Um, if you can bring staff and board together, because again, it helps you find the keys that you're missing. Um, and a board uh, that hasn't been totally filled out uh, always has space to add another person who can fill that, that gap. Um, as I mentioned a little earlier, this is one of my favorite things, is utilizing your board in a way that can be role-based. So instead of kind of thinking about what they bring to the table in terms of time, talent, treasure, and ties to give them a specific role in a meeting and, and kind of force them and challenge them um, to play that role, even if it's not their, their expertise. It's just a different perspective that can challenge some ideas. So as you have a meeting, um, this model, I think a high level way to explain it is that there are six personalities that you can give people. They're almost, they come in basically cards and they explain that if you wear a specific hat for this meeting, um, you will be coming to the conversation with one of these uh, 
these kind of frames. So a uh, blue hat will think about the process of what everyone is saying. The white hat will think about the facts, the pure facts. The red person will be very on the emotional side of things and reacting kind of at a gut level. Uh, the black hat is always thinking about, you know, what is the, what is the kind of the con of the argument? Uh, so what, why maybe not do this? Be the, the sort of uh, devil's advocate of a conversation. The green hat is all about coming up with creative potential. So how many different ideas could there be? Um, and the yellow hat is always really positive and thinking about kind of that feelings and making sure that everyone is, is being heard and um, you know, complimenting good ideas or just the culture of people speaking out. And so this, this model is, has been really helpful for me to think about if we're missing one of these hats in a conversation, there's a very good chance that there's a blind spot in what we're doing. Um, and so again, thinking about roles, intentional roles that you can set up if you are currently missing a perspective on your team. Um, and then last, I shared this, I think, in the last webinar, where we're actually co-designing a model ourselves um, with a, a, a new company called Barometer Interactive. Um, and it's all about storytelling. And so helping a board develop around a philosophy of saying, what we, what we believe makes a good team are these six characteristics. What characteristic do you feel like you can help with as a board member the most? And have them engage more in that way. Um, and so this is our kind of theory of change, if you will, on a high, like what we call as a high flying team. And the story around this is that launching a balloon is kind of akin to launching a project or launching a, an idea or an organization. And there are certain characteristics that can help you get that balloon off the ground and keep it sustaining and, and moving forward down um, a specific trajectory. And so using a story-based model can help people kind of put a vision to a lot of words. And so thinking about how people learn and how people work and being really intentional about um, you know, leveraging different perspectives and, and learning styles um, can be really important to, to maximizing and activating your board. Um, <clears throat> our, our main focus uh, of, of building a board and our kind of philosophy is that we want it to be a culture of exploring together. Um, and so that ranges from everything like we want to make sure that when they leave the board, they feel like they've learned something that they've grown with us, that they've participated and engaged in a way that's meaningful to them, and that we're not forcing what that means. Um, we want them to define it. Um, we want them to reflect on whether they're, they're successful. <laughs> and then we want to figure out how we can do better. Um, and so I always think about uh, the analogy of an escape room. For those of you who are familiar with kind of being locked in a room for 60 minutes and trying to get out, um, we love using these kinds of games to play with our teams to figure out where we can improve our communication, where we can improve our planning and kind of strategic process, but also um, understanding kind of what we're, what we're good at innately and how we can potentially build up an experience that can work on people's weaknesses so that they can grow professionally too. So if they see value in participating on the board, professionally and personally, uh, there's a very high chance that, that the priority of participating uh, will go up in their mind. And ultimately that's uh, where a lot of boards succeed is when people feel like they're getting out uh, potentially more out of the experience than you are as an organization, um, which is I think also what makes a good philanthropist is someone who's learning as they give. Um, and so with that kind of being said, we like to really focus in on the structural things. These are not kind of the sexy things of an organization, but they can really, 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 really be helpful. And, and just challenging what you do now um, and, and trying to, to map this out and put it in a visual language can help people understand, okay, these are this is how all the pieces connect. This is where I fit into this equation. This is where I can make a move and like actually participate at a, at a, a more granular level. This as a board member, you know, I'm going to stand back and kind of watch and oversee so that I can follow the conversation. Um, so we use all sorts of tools. We really love, um, you know, the open source, the, the Google Docs and Suite, I think a lot of us probably use those, but how do you structure those documents 
We actually use a tool like called Notion um, as our structural or kind of infrastructure or intranet. Um, it serves as our kind of client management platform, our vision and mission and all of our goals. And it's an open source, slightly more organized version of a Google Drive so that people can go in and see you kind of the meetings that we're having and, and just understand how those pieces connect in a slightly more visual way. Um, and so we're trying to, again, be intentional around transparency and knowing that our board doesn't have the time that we have to, to dedicate to, to this mission, but they certainly can drop in and see something well organized and say, oh, I've seen, you know, five or six things change pretty dramatically. And oh, that happens to be on the agenda that we're, you know, you were having in our upcoming meeting. And so structure is really important. Having an understood communication channel is important and not breaking those barriers um, is, is really is helpful for, for just stating a culture, sticking with it, and at some point addressing whether it's working or not. Um, the tool on the right of the screen here is a new one that we really liked and enjoyed using during the pandemic. It's called Gather. Um, we, there are a lot of different implications around this platform, um, but Gather is a great tool for, I think, humanizing the virtual meeting experience. Um, it's a little bit like, uh, like an old, Game Boy game. I don't know how good of a reference that is, but like I played a Pokemon growing up and you have this little avatar person that can move around the screen and the proximity of those two avatars um, is whether or not you can see or hear someone. And so it's trying to simulate a virtual happy hour. Um, and in a team room setting, uh, that could be really effective in kind of self-guiding conversations. And so instead of everyone being forced into breakout rooms or kind of sitting in a large group setting, trying to get back to that kind of human element. So again, always challenging how you can improve the status quo of meetings. I think a lot of boards got stagnant because uh, they didn't want to sit on, on their 15th Zoom meeting of the day after work um, when they're already kind of stressed in, in other parts of their life. And so again, thinking about those innovative ways that you can bring people to the table, um, but sticking with those tools um, once you've found a good one so that uh, you're not constantly leaving people behind or, or um, having kind of a tech, tech literacy uh, hill to climb every time you have a meeting. Um, <clears throat> kind of next piece is thinking about this as a, as a game design process. This is highly iterative. And I think our culture is, is reflective of that. And hopefully you can build one as well that's um, not stuck in one particular uh, process. I always challenge ways that you can be better at communicating with your board, how the board can um, kind of challenge itself in thinking about ways that it can be more effective. Um, and we have this kind of three-part model that we went through last kind of last couple cycles uh, of, of, of workshops um, where we shared that much like the game design process, developing a board process is it can be really similar. And I think the important piece to call out in this kind of three-part chain of like coming up with an idea, you know, iterating and, and prototyping a, a model of what could work and then kind of moving that to the final stage of of the logistics of how you might execute a new communication platform or a game that could help uh, align your board members and staff. Um, the iterative piece in the middle is, I think, the most critical part. As long as people are open to change and curious and have a growth mindset, those are the best board members um, because they're willing to try different things and figure out what works for them. Um, and if everyone's coming to the same page with that mindset, um, you'll be in really good shape to, to build a, a system that um, is always thinking ahead uh, and not it's more proactive than reactive. Um, and at some point, uh, as long as you have someone on your board who can kind of push things along, I think that generally is uh, leadership of the, of the organization. Uh, this, is, this is sometimes a really good model to turn to as, as a, a reminder of you know, keep things fluid and dynamic, but make sure that you're always thinking about your end result, which is um, just getting better as a group. Uh, 
<clears throat> then we like to lean on peer inspiration. So as I mentioned, uh, I think everyone in this group has uh, a lot of insight to share in this, in this space. Um, one of my favorites um, is a group called Nonprofit AF. Um, it, this one person, his name is Vu Li, uh, V-U-L-E is his name, um, just has a lot of really interesting perspectives around philanthropy in general. And he has a specific link, and I'll drop that in the chat, where he has something that says 25 awesome things or things that awesome board members do. And I think it's, a, it's just kind of setting or normalizing that there are a lot of ways that a board member can participate. Um, and they don't have to do them all, but they have to recognize and be aware that uh, as a board member, you have a lot of potential influence in an organization. You can really drive a conversation forward. Um, and I think that comes across in a lot of the trends we're seeing in philanthropy in general. There's a lot of trust-based projects out there. There's a great trust-based philanthropy project in, in, in kind of growing around uh, funders and, and making sure that they're thinking about um, the relationships that they're building. And I think for a board member, tapping into some of the principles of trust-based philanthropy could be really helpful in their own board service, but also recognizing what other boards and what other nonprofits and funders are looking for. Um, there is a giving circle network in the area. Um, it's, it's through uh, an organization called Grow Fund. There are about 20 or 25 of them. And giving circles are amazing ways for board members to potentially take a leadership role in a giving institution. Um, pooling dollars and, and trying to navigate the space of, of donating to a nonprofit is, I think, a very good learning experience for a board member. So if you have younger board members, um, that could be a really interesting tool um, for them to, to be able to grow their, um, their capacity in, in helping the organization in a specific way. Um, there are a lot of organizations, much like the Catalog, National Council of Nonprofits, um, that are that are really good for for just kind of tuning into what are the what's the latest on on kind of what boards should be and and what are some good best practices that are shared in blogs and things like that. So kind of leaning on peers. Um, and then I would be remiss not to say that I currently sit on a board called the Unfunded List. And so thinking about how you can integrate and message a, a nonprofit that you are supporting in different contexts. One, to practice those, um, those kind of pitches and kind of get reactions and be able to share those reactions with the staff of a nonprofit. Um, I can't tell you how many times um, I've gone around and kind of shared the idea of uh, what Unfunded List does with a, a nonprofit. So they they offer feedback to rejected grant proposals. That's essentially what they do. and. They have a group of volunteer reviewers. Uh, and for me, I see in philanthropy, this as a huge possibility to help make it more collaborative. Um, and I think once you have that kind of thread of how you can position yourself in all of your different social circles, um, you'll see a lot more uh, utility in, um, in that statement. Like you'll go around to a dinner party. Oh wow! Like I met this person, and this they, we had a quick conversation about a board that I was on, and and he had some feedback for me, and that was great. And I brought it back to the executive director, and that helped them sculpt a particular project, or it led to a connection. And you started thinking about again the time, talent, treasure, and ties. Um, if they're always thinking about how they can help you, um, board members are 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 invaluable in that way. Um, so let's see. Uh, I know this has been more of a monologue and I wanna make this um, more interactive at this point. So I'm gonna kind of stop, uh, I'll leave this as, as sort of my final slide and then wanna open it up for questions and conversation and people being able to share what has been really successful for them. But in the chat, would love you to answer this question, just kind of start us off. Um, if the board could help you with any one thing right now, just wave your magic wand and they'd be able to help, what would that be? Um, if you can answer that question, that will put you on maybe a good starting point of either a key that you're missing um, or a way to have a conversation with the board to say, this is really where we need some, some assistance. 
Um, and though there are some different kinds of conversations of like, how do you do that? Um, I think identifying them is, is and doing it clearly is, is one of the first things that can set you on that track. So I always think of a board as like the 12th man, if you're familiar with football, American or European football, uh, you know, having 11 people on the field, but your 12th man is your fans. It's the, the crowd that's around you. It's the support system of the team. And it really can give you a leg up um, and, and give you an extra, an extra bit of motivation and, and support. So um, with that, I'll stop sharing. Um, would love to see, yes, I'm seeing some, some chat uh advocating for increased pay and better benefits for staff yes love that um run their committees independently of the ed yes interdependence is uh really critical i love that one too um do either of you want to share a little bit more about kind of what has led you to to kind of put that above all else sure um there's just a lot of conversation around pay equity going on at City Kids. Um, and also, like, what does a full compensation package mean, you know, in, when you include benefits and vacation days and things like that. And so trying to get our organization to industry standard. Um, and I feel like you know, the ED is driving this message, which is great, but if there were some board advocates that would support it, you know, we have a significant endowment, our, our investments have performed well, we had a strong fundraising um, year last year. So if the board would support investing in those sort of things um, at the organizational level, they could ultimately make a decision that we would pull from an endowment to support this initiative. You know, they, they kind of pull those purse strings when like right now, the onus is on the development department to kind of figure out like, how do we raise more money so we can pay more people? Yep, yep, I've, I've seen, seen that on a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is, it, a board member who is your biggest advocate can, uh, can really help. Uh, because it sounds like you have a lot of resources to be able to pull from, um, which is a great position to be in um, for organizations that may not have that endowment, may not have the sort of the, the pool of capital to pull from and, and be able to, to, to kind of quickly act. Um, what are the things that they could do uh, to help that process along, um, you know, and, and maybe work on the grant grant funding side and really kind of thinking about different ways to be able to raise a little bit more and um, make that apparent in the conversation with a funder, right? And so there, there are a couple different ways that you can address that. But again, time, talent, treasure, and ties, uh, they could use all four of those um, to, to, help, to help get pay standards higher for staff and recognizing what that means, right? Uh, the last 15 months, I, there are so many people who have just been like, I am at the end of the rope, right? Of like, I am not getting paid enough. I'm working like 17 hour days for 360 days a year. Like it's just, it's overwhelming. And so I think putting that in clear standards for anybody who supports the organization, I think most board, more, most board members, whether they're engaged or not, will be empathetic to that statement. Um, it's just the fact of I think there is a relationship, sometimes toxic relationship between funders, board members, and staff, um, where it's, we believe that our organization is great and nothing's wrong and, and uh, they don't want to kind of face the facts of, you know what, it's not perfect for everybody. Uh, and so coming up and building a culture that's able to come to the table with that and hear the different perspectives without there being some kind of repercussion is where we see a lot of benefits of play. Um, of just kind of starting people along that road, celebrating the wins, and then being reflective and saying, you know, this is where we can improve our process. So um, that I totally agree with the assessment. Uh, I uh, and hopefully, hopefully, there's a way to to, to catalyze a couple board members because I think uh, even at the board level, peers can be helpful and influential to pass it along. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Anyone else in the chat about what what uh, 
the interdependence piece is, I think, really important too. So if you want to speak to that, I would love to hear a little more. Well, I just bring it up because it's a general matter of engagement of the board of directors. And I think they're more engaged in the end if they are running their own activities rather than me suggesting that they do these things or that these things are part of their committee responsibilities. And, and you know, certainly my board has gotten better about it, but there's still a little bit of a disconnect around um, events and who does them and how they get done and whether we even do them. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's an ongoing process and a, a work in progress. <laughs> yeah. how, how big is the board? Um, the board is 11 people. 11 people. Yeah. So and we're pretty, a very small organization. So. Yep. So small organization, kind of big board. It can maybe feel at times that the board is like, you know, we can run our own project and just kind of run on our own, do something over here, but it has nothing to do with maybe a program that you're trying to, to run or accomplish. And yeah, that can be very, very frustrating. And again, like trying to get on the same page so that people can have the intentional conversation of like, this is our immediate goals. Here's transparently what we're trying to do and this project isn't directly addressing that so while we love the energy um how can we how can we kind of realign realign our our stars and then you know reflecting on the fact that uh that might be what they really want to do so how can you connect connect the dots back to some of the projects uh that you're that you're hoping to run mm -hmm. uh, so yes interdependence is really important hard to find uh especially in older uh, or longer term board members that have almost become complacent in their their duty of like, I've done this for 17 years or like, mm -hmm. it's never been like this before. And uh, uh, yeah, again, that's where I think play could maybe help catalyze um, a different environment um, where people are like, okay, this feels a little different. I feel like I know people a little bit better, maybe more comfortable coming to certain members of the board or staff and saying, you know, how can I help more? Or I'm seeing some friction here or there. And the more opportunities to see those kinds of things and feel safe talking about them can really help. Um, one of the other things that had popped up in a conversation the other day that I had was around age of board members. Uh, I think all organizations deal with this differently, um, but most of the time a board member is, is going to be on the older side because they have the time and they might have the treasure or the the capital to be able to to support the board and i think strategically for a long time that has been uh, a really good model right you can you can you can find some fundraising you can find those connections that people have because they just know the community more um but trying to figure out how you might be able to leverage the, the professional capacity of a city. So, you know, having a younger handful of people on your board to really bring some new perspectives to the deal can be super helpful. Um, and especially if you're working around a specific demographic, um, you know, bringing in younger board members I know is, is rare, but uh, if you find people who are aligned in that space for their job um, can be incredibly beneficial um, across again, time, talent, treasure ties. Um, so I'm curious if, if people, when they look at their board or like, there's a perspective we're missing and one of those things is younger people. Uh, Cause I think there are a lot of folks that are looking to get involved, but they're one intimidated by not knowing uh, what, what their capacity is because they are working a nine to five job or potentially more or potentially they're in a nonprofit environment like this, but want to see a different organization for for perspective, um, or they're um, they're feeling like they're getting run over by older board members because they kind of have the lay of the land better, uh, and it's not as inviting. And so, thinking about how you can build infrastructure around um, to set that up. So, curious if anybody has thoughts about that um, before I move forward. Okay, I'll move forward. Carrie, I like your I like your picture. Uh, <laughs> I 
I was going to say, I actually do. I was thinking about it. Um, we have a junior board that our board formed in response to that exact need. Um, our board is mostly 65 plus and our founder is approaching 90. So, and she recently retired. Um, but the junior board has come to me. I'm their direct liaison for a lot of their events and everything and has felt steamrolled by the folks on the executive board with capital with you know a lot of time on their hands so i'm wondering if you have any ideas of how to use this like this great gaming structure to kind of bring those two boards together who are coming from wildly different generations yeah um my my first instinct and things that i've seen a lot is um don't use tech unless the older members of the board <laughs> Um, are really comfortable with it because that will just immediately leave people behind. Um, I think the instinct is that everyone knows how to use these new tools. We've been on Zoom for, I don't know, 15, 18 months. Not at all, right? Like people still don't know how to, to mute themselves or use the annotate feature or any of that. But it, and and they might be at a point of their life where they don't feel like they need professional development. Right, which could be another problem um, because you don't have necessarily that growth mindset of like, I want to learn something from this experience. It's more, I would like to leave a legacy. Um, and I think recognizing what they're aiming to get out of this conversation um, or out of this board, board engagement uh, will help kind of figure out what, what fun thing to do. Uh, and I know that's super, super vague, but if someone is really hoping to leave a legacy, you know, can you build an exercise that gets them thinking about uh, including uh, mentoring some of the younger junior members as a part of that, right? Um, and thinking about how they're leaving the board in a really good place um, because the younger members have just more time to be able to give, right? And, um, and so for us, we, a lot of the times use games to, to build the relationships and just make sure that in the games that you're playing, um, you intentionally choose activities that people will understand and start simple. Um, you know, you don't have to go invent the most world's most complicated game that defines like you know, all of the nuances of the organization or of different kind of characters and personas of, of a story, right? You can start with like Pictionary <laughs> or you can start with something really simple just so that when you start playing together, you, you can reflect on that shared experience. I can't stress enough how shared experiences will help this, right? You all of a sudden have that um, access to, wow, you know, these two people really enjoyed this game. This person didn't, why is that? Like, how can we, how can we drive to make this a more inclusive experience? I think we have a lot of conversations in that kind of like diversity, equity, and inclusion realm right now that, um, you know, more or less focused around kind of the racial relationships in the community. Um, but there are a lot of other pieces, disabilities, uh, there just there are a lot of pieces that you can you can pull in some of those best practices to try to work on age disparity you know, to work with, um, and so you know lean on those resources too and what you're hearing in those conversations to think about kind of like what games might work. Um, but we found uh, you can push the edge a little bit on technology, but don't push it too far. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. For sure. Um, any other thoughts? Otherwise, we'll do a quick a quick brainstorm. Just I so I always find um, collectively coming up with a game uh, something really abstract. So in architecture school, just to kind of I guess contextualize this this exercise, um, I went through a lot of processes where we would look at just like a random ob like set of objects. It could be like a bunch of chairs that are stacked in a room or it could be, you know, a garbage pile. And one of the first things that a lot of people say is that you have to get out of your own way to try to design the perfect game or the perfect exercise or the perfect thing. Just start with something kind of random and focus on a particular part of that. And so we would look at a very small piece of that random pile of things. And then over time, we would develop some of the 
the strings and some of the mechanics and the conversations that came out of what people see in what you're designing, and it would turn into a full on building. And that building would have a philosophy and a story and it would have this whole set of things. And so for game design, we like to use a lot of the same mechanisms of like starting with something totally random. It does not have to be connected to your organization just to unlock the creative potential of what you might be able to do with play. Um, and so we'll use for the sake of this exercise, some of your random objects from before. Um, I'll choose a couple at random, um, but we'll go with, uh, a blueberry um, and a blue postcard, and like or just a postcard uh, as our two objects. And I'm going to share my screen again here. Um, and I want you to think and just write down how could you use a blueberry and or a postcard uh, to activate your board? Uh, this is going to sound very silly and very random. Um, but hopefully you can start thinking about, all right, I've got these two objects. Um, what can I do with those two objects? Uh, or what can the board do with those two objects to, to help um, your mission? So an example might be uh, they do a, let's see if I can, if you wanna say them out loud, type them in the chat, um, I can write them on the screen here. Um, but an example might be you do like, a fundraiser where you sell a bunch of blueberries, right? And they go out and they sell blueberries and postcards to the, the community. Um, postcards. So if you know how to use the annotate tool, it's at the top of your screen. There's a view options menu um, and an annotate function that if you want to type on the screen, you can do that too. But I'm happy to, to, to take ideas. Um, I'm looking through. So using a blueberry and a postcard, uh, you can think about this too. You know, how might you creatively use those objects? Yes, time and ties, I'm seeing it. Uh, share a blueberry pie with community connections to cultivate new stakeholders. I love it. Yes, you know, thinking about how you can use, um, there's some talent in there too. I certainly can't make a blueberry pie. Um, but thinking about how you can um, use what people know how to do a random object. And what I would take out of that is not necessarily the blueberry pie, but more the second part of that statement, right? Um, something that you can share um, with your community connections, something that you can use to entice new stakeholders, um, new board members to the table, um, something that kind of builds a culture. Um, so I love that. That's a great example. Um, I'll give people a little bit of time to think about it. We don't have to write them on the, on the board here. Um, but I could see ways that you could use postcards as, as mail. I mean, I can't tell you how many times uh, I get excited when I get mail from anyone, right? I'm 30 years old and I get a postcard and I'm like, oh my gosh, I got mail. I must be important. Um, never underestimate the power of kind of person to person one on one interaction time. So sending a postcard to someone uh, to say that, you know, you really appreciate their time and effort that they took to do something. Uh, something very simple like that could be very influential on kind of where they prioritize their next project with your organization. Um, and not saying that there should be that kind of power dynamic of paying to get service, but Again, the goal really to build a culture of appreciation and um, open feedback. Uh, you know, those are kinds of things, just small things that board members could do for staff. Um, staff could do for board members. It's not really a one way situation. So I will let me stop my share. as people are kind of thinking through these ideas. Um, I know we're running up to the end of time, so I want to be respectful of that, but hopefully this gives people some things to think about. Um, I know less playful than, than normal. Um, I figured with a smaller group, it gives us the opportunity to, to really address some of the, the pieces. And, and I encourage everyone to talk to um, each other about 
different things that you've done um, in your own in your own kind of board relationship or board stewardship conversations um, that have worked and that haven't worked because I think uh, the more we share with each other, the more I think we'll normalize some of the good practices and that board members will see, oh wow, this is a board that I really I, I'm really inspired by what they've done. And so I would like to try to bring that into our own board. Um, and and the catalog certainly can help because they've seen they've seen a few things, right, Laura? <laughs> Um, but thank you all um, for, for coming in. I know as we come into kind of the beginning of summer, um, everyone, everyone kind of looks outside and is just like, oh, it's really nice out. Got to get outside in the morning. Um, so please take care of your health. Um, have, a, have a great summer. And we'll, we'll be back next month um, for a creative programming. We'll do a little bit more play and games there because we've got a lot of examples that we've used in the past. Awesome. And thank you, Peter. Um, this, was, this was great. Um, and I'll send out the slides and recording um, later today. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, all.